are live. Okay, great. Well, thank you everybody for joining our last session of the day. Uh, it's uh, tech session 6A, Human and Robotic Space Exploration. So we have a, a good lineup of speakers here. We have three speakers. Uh, the first one is uh, Carissa uh, Campbell from York University. So I'd ask the other speakers, Yannick and Healy, maybe to turn off your, your videos uh, for now, and we'll, we'll let you turn them on uh, when it's your turn to speak. Uh, so, so Carissa is going to be presenting Maple, a simple optical meteorological station uh, for Mars. And I'll let you go ahead and share your screen. And uh, Yannick, uh, if you can just turn off your video, um, uh, Haley, uh, sorry, Carissa will be presenting next. Yeah, thank you. I have to, I All right, can you see it? Yeah, I can see it and hear you. All right, perfect. So. Welcome everyone. My name is Carissa Campbell. I'm a PhD student under John Morris at York University. And today I'm going to talk to you about Maple, which is a simple optical meteorological station for Mars. So a bit of a background to Martian meteorology. Mars actually does exhibit two seasons due to its highly elliptical orbit and its obliquity, which is similar to Earth. So therefore we get two different seasons, dust during perihelion when temperatures are warmer, and cloud during aphelion where temperatures are cooler. Now during the dust season, because the temperatures are warmer, it can actually cause dust to be kicked up into the atmosphere, which can cause local or even global dust storms. As you can see in the lower part there with the GIF, um, courtesy of the Curiosity rover, which was able to capture dust movement in the crater. And you can see how opaque it is during this time. And this was Mars year 34 or in 2018. Now on the other side of Mars's orbit, during aphelion when it's much cooler, um, water ice particles are actually able to form and create this equatorial cloud belt, which is also seen by the Curiosity rover. Um, as you can see, some nice gravity waves captured by the rover um, in Gale Crater. So a bit about Martian exploration. So it is easier to send orbiters rather than surface vehicles. As you can see by this figure here, a lot more orbiters have been sent to Mars than surface vehicles. And it's because it is easier. You don't have to do any entry, descent, or landing. All you have to do is basically put it in the orbit and figure out that, and you are good to go. And orbiters are also really great because they cover more area, and you're not limited to driving control. However, there is a caveat where they do struggle with lower parts of the atmosphere as the more you look through the atmosphere, the thicker it is. And therefore, any altitudes less than 10 kilometers is very difficult for an orbiter to see through. Therefore, surface vehicles are really great at looking at that. So we've only had a limited amount of surface vehicles exploring the Martian surface, as you can see by this diagram here. And they can actually help piece together what orbiters can't. However, because we are limited by driving constraints, we are only really looking at local conditions, as you can see hypothetically in these blue circles here. Therefore, there's really only two areas that could be comparable to each other, such as Viking 1 and Pathfinder, and then Insight and Curiosity. Therefore, we are missing a lot of question mark in the areas of Mars that we have not put anything there yet. And therefore, we must rely on other methods to be able to solve the areas that we have not been able to put surface vehicles on. And those would be Martian global climate models. And these really rely on um, the data from Mars to help us fill in the gaps of Martian atmospheric data, where it almost creates this feedback loop, where the more Martian data we have, which gets pumped into the models, and then we get a model data out, and then we can kind of look at the answer and compare it back to Martian data. And therefore, you kind of get this loop. Therefore, the more data we have, the more accurate our models will be. And it's actually been suggested that 15 widely displaced meteorological stations on Mars are needed to validate a global climate model. However, how do we solve this problem when we already know how hard and expensive it is to put a surface vehicle on Mars? And this leads to MAPLE, which is the Mars Atmospheric Panoramic Camera and Laser Experiment. It consists of as you can guess, a panoramic camera, and currently three monochromatic lasers, as you can see in the diagram here. Um, Canadensis has been really uh, great and offers a panoramic camera for us to use. So we're able to really test um, this panoramic model and idea with the three lasers. And the goal for this is to 
basically make a small low powered optical meteorological station where we can maximize the science return by minimizing constraints, which will make it cheaper and easier to take to Mars and therefore span the surface of Mars and create all of those needed meteorological stations so we can really be able to test models and get better data out of models. Therefore, we really need to note limitations from previous Martian surface missions and really see what can we already do on Mars. So taking a look back at that map there where you can see all the different surface vehicles, it is apparent that you can see different atmospheric uh, conditions based on just imagery. Phoenix was able to see thicker clouds in the northern hemisphere. Even Perseverance has already seen dust lifting. InSight rover has captured clouds, and Curiosity is able to also see dust devils as well as clouds in Gale Crater. So therefore, by just using imagery, we're able to classify and characterize atmospheric conditions in the lower part of the atmosphere. I'm going to talk about two different missions today, particularly the Phoenix mission, which was in the North Hemisphere. It was actually able to carry out four experiments using, utilizing the surface space uh, imager and the LIDAR to successfully measure aerosol properties such as ice water content by simply taking an image of the LIDAR in effect. As you can see here, here's an image of the LIDAR on Phoenix, and you can see the geometry of the LIDAR with taking the camera. However, because of that geometry, it was actually very difficult to use this instrument simultaneously as you're talking about two different instruments and trying to basically line them up so you can get the LIDAR right and the SSI has a really low field of view so therefore you really need to line it up correctly which made it very complicated to use um, on Mars. And therefore um, we're going to try to expand this for Maple to try to make it a bit better. And I do want to also show this nice GIF here which you can see this uh, twinkle of the laser and the atmospheric around it. So therefore this is kind of what the experiment that we're hoping to do with Maple will look like. The next mission I do want to talk about is the Curiosity mission. Um, using the navigation cameras, which are just under the mast of Curiosity, we are able to take these atmospheric movies in different positions to get a variety of cloud and dust properties just through imagery. For example, the Zenith movie, which is at the top one here, basically looks at the um, sky up right above the rover and is able to calculate opacity, wind direction, and an angular wind speed just through these eight frames that are turned into a movie. Another atmospheric movie taken by Curiosity is the Super Horizon movie, which looks more at the crater rim, as you can see in the movie there. And this one is also really great at measuring opacity, wind direction, and the morphology of the clouds that you see in Gale Crater. And Close It All 2018 was able to take this cloud opacity and noted that thicker clouds with greater opacity were in the morning versus the afternoon. Now, two other observations that are taken in the Apulin cloud belt season, the phase function sky survey and the cloud altitude observation, are a great expansion of the atmospheric movies and what science we can really get out of them. For example, the phase function sky survey basically takes the atmospheric movies you've seen, but creates a dome of them of nine different pointings and three images at each pointing. And you can classify ice crystal shape and the phase function based on how the sunlight is passing through the image at different angles. And then the cloud altitude observation um, utilizes um, geological features in Gale Crater, aka Aeolus Mons or Mount Sharp, and then a Zenith movie, which is right above the rover, to classify an angular wind speed versus an actual wind speed by following shadows move across the mountain to directly calculate cloud altitude, which is usually impossible without a LIDAR, which unfortunately Curiosity doesn't have. So we have to figure out other methods to be able to pull the cloud altitude from this location, and this is how we would do it. So expanding these two missions together, Phoenix we know has a small camera field of view and a higher operational complexity, so therefore we want to try to change that so we can make improvements for Maple. And Curiosity, even though it does have a larger camera field of view, it's still limited, and we do have to make sure our pointings are correct. And we also have data volume concerns because each movie is eight frames each, which has so many data volume to it. So therefore, the more images we're sending back, the greater data volume we have. And therefore, we want to lower that with an algorithm, which will minimize this problem. So the science out you can get from both of these are quite large. And therefore, we need to try to see with Maple, are we able to replicate this kind of science returned by Phoenix and Curiosity? 
So our development plan for Maple right now actually has three phases. We are actually currently in phase one, which includes instrument construction, lab testing, and local environment verification. You can see an example of the panoramic camera there uh, taken at York University and the different types of clouds in the atmosphere above. Once we are able to get into the lab more, um, we're hoping to do this experiment with um, a beaker and an aquarium, which will be comparable to Smith et al. 2018, which shown, shined a laser through water to get um, particle size and distribution, and therefore try to see if we can look down rather than up and try to get back the science that we could possibly from Phoenix. Now, and the algorithm that I was uh, describing to you, I have published at Campbell et al. 2021, which uses computer vision and machine learning to basically classify the wind direction seen in atmospheric movies taken by Curiosity. Now we can see when there are really great cloud features in the movie, the algorithm does really well at calculating the wind direction and the distance that the clouds moved. However, when we have multiple cloud decks that move in different directions, lighting effects, or even different camera effects, it really confuses the algorithm. And therefore, the algorithm does need to be trained more to ignore these type of things. In phase two of our development, which we're aiming for spring 2022, we're hoping to go to an aerosol-rich environment, such as St. John's, Newfoundland, with thick fog. So we can really test maple and see how it does with different types of volatiles and different size of particles, rather than going straight to the very thin Martian particles. And this will be a non-remote operations where we will be taking maple ourselves and testing it there and seeing it how it does in that type of environment. And of course, lastly, we do need to test it on a Martian-like environment. And that would be up in the Arctic where there is what is considered diamond dust, very, very thin particles that are very similar to Martian water ice particles. And it will be a bit of, a boat of, bit of both non-remote and remote operations um, where we will take it up there for a bit, get it set up, test it, and then we will leave it up there for a bit to see if we can remote use it from York University up to the Arctic. And we are aiming for this for winter 2023. So just want to say thank you. Um, here's a bit of a background into my talk about Maple and how it wants to minimize mission costs for maximize science return and considers what we've already learned from previous Mars missions. And therefore, we have a three-phase plan, which we are currently still working on lab testing and will eventually take to two field test sites. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Great. Thank you very much, Carissa. That was a great presentation. Um, so I'd like to ask all audience members to use the chat window to ask any questions to Carissa. And if not, then you'll just leave it up to me to, to grill Carissa here. <laughs> I'm no expert though in this field, so, um, but that's okay, I'm gonna ask some questions. So uh, do you, uh, you know, you had the three phases of your development plan. Um, it did not include launching to Mars. Um, uh, is that, wh what's the kind of time frame and what's the kind of ideal mission scenario for um, deploying this instrument on the, on the surface of Mars? Well, once we're able to test in the Arctic condition, which is very much what Martian-like conditions would be, um, I'm not sure of the exact timeline, but I would assume that the next steps from there would be to test it maybe in sub-orbital -or um, conditions, and then maybe even look into how we could even send it to Mars. Of course, that could be many years outside of even my PhD that someone else might take that over, um, but I don't anticipate that for at least a few more years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. So again, reminder to to use the chat window here uh, to ask any questions to Carissa. Um, so I'll, I'll ask another one. So you mentioned St. John's being a, um, an aerosol rich environment. Um, could you kind of elaborate a bit on what that kind of means to us? you know, meager engineers in the room who uh, don't really, you know, like what, what kind of weather features are you looking for there and, and why is St. John's a good spot? Um, so we're really looking for fog, really thick fog, which have really large size aerosols compared to um, serious clouds, which would be very thin. Um, and it's basically to test how maple does when we do have larger aerosols, right? Perhaps maple would be even good for terrestrial studies and therefore we could maybe apply for it to be in thicker fog. Um, so 
basically that's what that means. It doesn't have to be St. John's. It could be anywhere that has thicker fog. Um, my supervisor is from Newfoundland, so he was probably thinking of home and how much fog is actually there. Um, but that is kind of what we're aiming for is the thicker aerosol sizes. Very nice. Very nice. All right. Okay. Well, we are uh, doing well on time. So we have a few minutes before the next speaker, but um, maybe I can take this time to uh, introduce them. And uh, let me just pull up the schedule. I've lost it here. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, Carissa. I will uh, go to the next presentation now, which is by Yannick uh, Yego. Is that how you pronounce your, your name, Yannick? Yeah, hello, Michel. Yes, you're right. Yannick Jego. Oh. It's, a, so it's Jego. a French name, but don't worry. I believe uh, I live in Germany, and we're used to to hear Jego. So uh, that's okay. You pronounce my name the French way, but it's actually Italian. It's Michele, so that's okay. I understand. Okay, sorry, <laughs> Michele. <laughs> right. So, so Yannick will be presenting today on. Um, Yannick is from Airbus Defense and Space, and we'll be presenting on uh, uh, Bartolomeo. Uh, external payload mission hosting on the ISS as a service. So we're, we're a little ahead of time, so feel free to take your time there, Yannick, but uh, really it's over to you if you want to get started. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Michele, and uh, thank you for Casey for, 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 for allowing us to, to present again because not the first time uh, uh, Bartolomeo. Uh, so uh, if you go to the next slide, I don't know if you have to switch on my camera. Do it because uh, people can see me. Um, yes, I don't see you, but I, I think. Um... Yeah, 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 yeah. I will take times a little bit. Okay. okay. So uh, if you, well, so here I am. Uh, so here, this is the first slide, and very interesting is to see that we have a product uh, which is in place on the ISS, so on the International Space Station, and especially uh, in front of the uh, Columbus modules. It means the European. Uh, module and uh, of course uh, we have this developed this product even is a hundred percent funding uh, development and product from Airbus Defense Space and uh, we have a partnership with ESA in order to allow us to attach it to to, to the ISS to the Columbus module and to use and to use uh, the we said the, all of the system and and, and as well the Astronaut hours uh, to operate this uh, platform uh, on the ISS. So the, what we are here uh, presenting is the platform, but what we 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 want to to introduce is the services associated to to the platform because this service is to allow everybody from small. Uh, payloads in mean terms of uh, less effort, I wish in terms of development, to very large payloads, scientific payloads for for this deep, deep, deep space sorry exploration to to get an easy access uh, to the uh, LEO, I will say, orbit. Um, uh, if you go to the next slide, please, uh, and um, so we have this partnership with ESA, which allow uh, Next slide. I don't know. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I've got it. Sorry. Uh, and 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 so that's what we have as well another partnership with NASA and and with uh, Cases. So it means that uh, we are proposing to to bring up your payload. So here you see some boxes. So we don't put your payload in some boxes, but is to give you uh, an idea of the volume. So uh, the boxes you have, the blue or the green, they allow uh, to place payload, whatever the shape is, of around uh, 80 millimeter per 70 millimeter and the, and, and, and the height of one meter. So it can be very, something very, very vol volumetric, but uh, we have as well possibility to, to accommodate a uh, small payload, so one U, uh, to term with this unit, uh, but in this case it will be in in a sharing mode. We will see it later. So the big advantage we have here is to have uh, we have to be in front of the Columbus module in it to have an open view. So to the to the flight direction and to the RAM here is indicated uh, to the RAM direction, to the flight direction, but as well to the zenith and to the nadir. So we are we are very 
very good uh, 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 field of view to the free direction which allow us to, to be one of the best uh, place on the ISS to, uh, to make, uh, for instance, observations. Um, so uh, we're proposing a service, or so what we call an all-in-one all space mission service. It means that uh, we take care of all the operation to bring your payload uh, on the on the ISS, uh, and we do it for one year, a minimum time of one year. Even if you only need three three months, we we give you the opportunity to to stay one year on the outside the ISS. So next slide, please. And you see here, this is the, the services. So if you could start from the, the, the left to, 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 to the right. So uh, we have fly opportunity because we are using the, the, the cargo launch or uh, the cargo service, uh, sorry, from the, the ISS, so mainly Dragon, but it can be Seconders, can be ATAs. Uh, it can as well be a Soyuz. It will be not so often because Soyuz is quite, quite busy, I would say. And uh, here, what you see, uh, what what is very important is to note that we need at least at least 12 months before the launch date uh, to get uh, your request for flying on the ISS because uh, we have to declare your payload, your mission to the ISS authorities, so ESA and, and NASA, uh, in order to, to know at first the first uh, authorization, to know if, if this kind of mission, if this kind of payload is allowed on the ISS, and to start then the process of, 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 of getting you all the clear, clearance for your payload and your mission to, to fly. Doesn't mean that 12 months before the start you need to have a payload ready to fly, but it means that 12 months before the, 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 the flight date you have to, uh, we have to present at least your project, and, and the delivery of your payload will take place uh, more or less around three, four months before before the launch date. We can do it in three months before. We can do it sometimes in two months, depending, of course, uh, how busy is uh, the launch preparation. So it means payload preparation on ground, mainly look, focusing on some interfaces test, preparation of the procedure for the astronauts, and, and uh, packaging, uh, packaging the payload for, for, for a safe flight uh, to the ISS. And after you have the flight, which is included, in the services, and of course, once you arrive, because all payload arrive to the ISS, to the ISS and will be transferred inside the ISS and be prepared to be put outside the ISS through the full automatic operation with the Canadian robotic arm. And then, once you are in place outside the, uh, the ISS on Bartolomeo, we have what we call a, a very simple commissioning uh, operation to make sure you, uh, the system is, is well working. And then you can start to get uh, to, 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 to download you, you, you data and even to upload some comments uh, for, for, for doing, uh, performing your, your experiment. Uh, we propose a lot of additional services, sometimes adaptation of the payload or making the fact that your payload that don't have the right interfaces, for instance, you were able to, uh, to, to adapt, to put some option uh, on our side to make happening your missions. Uh, and of course, we, are, we propose a return of the payload. Uh, depending on the size, it could be free, but depending on the size can be uh, some, at some additional cost. Uh, your mission. Uh, the, the, the data downloading uh, is as, as well uh, managed by ourselves and you will get all your data in uh, on you uh, on your computer on your laptop through an interfaces with the Airbus cloud so uh, you, you you only only um, um, instruction you have to, to follow is that this kind of uh, personal computer or laptop you will use should have to be in a safe place. So you, you, you commit to, uh, to, to, to make this operation in a safe place. Usually is, a, is an office which is uh, closed and, and have to respect some, 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 some rules, uh, which will be, of course, informed of that part. There will be no control. It's something that you have commit. You have to sign a uh, declaration, dec declaration, sorry, to, to make sure you, you are following the, the rules. Uh, 
Um, so next slide. Um, please, thank you. Um, so we have a different location. You see from the top of the payload, we have, uh, we said uh, 12 locations. So you see one, one A, one B, so we, we can attach to one position. For example, one A, we can uh, attach a second payload, but we can, for instance, to use the the large volume on the 1A, 1B, or the 2A, 2B, uh, 5A, 5B, and 6A, 6B, as we call a double slot. So you can have a very, really important uh, volume for, for, for your payload and experiment uh, because we are more of 1.2 cubic meter and we can uh, us up to 400, sorry, 450 kilograms. So it is really, really huge. And you can get a very high level of power, up to 800 watts, uh, depending on the location. If you have something on the on the size 6B, 5B, for instance, uh, we have more limited power up to 400 watts. And if you have a, a, a number eight, you cannot see it because it's below the platform, you are limited to 180 watts. And we have what we call an extra tool, an extra carrier for small payload, we call Argus, so a link to the Argo and, uh, and, and Argus, which were the vessel used by the Greek, uh, the Greek uh, during the antiquity, and of course, uh, US, because it's a product developed by your colleagues from uh, Houston, Texas, uh, in US. And here you see the double place with a unique interface. We can place everywhere in different location. Is a ride sharing solution, so you not, will not fly alone. And according to the, to the, to the request of a different user of this uh, Argus, we will place in the most uh, the most appropriate uh, location. So it could be one B. Usually, we we'll be in front of uh, between two A, three B, three, four, or five, five A or eight, five B as well. Uh, the big advantage, if you uh, sorry, if you go to the next slide with these argers, is it even a much more uh, easier interfaces for your payload. So it makes even easier uh, the, the hosting a payload uh, on Bartolo because here your interface you have mechanic interfaces. So with some uh, you have to have a, a enough interface plate, some some holes, and, and, and we that's when we screw them there, and you have a, to have some, some uh, harnesses and a, and a connector, uh, which is a standard product. We have no specific uh, testing uh, space product. Uh, it's quite uh, standard products, making making the additional cost for you very very limited. Um, and we will perform some uh, thermal analysis to make sure that your payload will not suffer from some interaction with all the uh, all the payload. And of course, we will we will uh, we will place your payload to the to the to the best position to allow you to make uh, your experiment. So here we can host usually up to 10 payloads, normally it's five payloads. So we have only the 28 uh, VDC interface. We don't have the 120 anymore. Uh, looking at the request for a lot of customers, we, we remember the, 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 this 120 was not often re, uh, requested, even uh, never ever requested. So we will have only 28 uh, voltage interface. interface sorry. <laughs> Um, yes, uh, if you go to the, not to the next slide, please, but to, uh, we, uh, we will go to, to the second, second slide, uh, to not the next, but uh, we spring the next slide. Uh, so it's uh, here to show you uh, what kind of field of view you have if you look at Zenith and, and Nadir, and if you can see, it's not very easy, but you see a run in the in, in, in the center, which is pointing the, the Zenith, for instance, on the left side or on the Nadir. Uh, you have more or less a 20 degrees, even if it be more. Uh, uh, a free of view, uh, the, 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 the dark blue uh, showing uh, the shadow uh, created by the solar panel because on the ISS, the solar panel and moving continuously to get the maximum of sun and it, uh, inducing some some shadow on the field of view. But uh, the, you see that the center 
uh, around 20, 20, 25 degrees is always or mainly always free. So it's a very big uh, advantage. If you go to the next slide, so Bartolomeo, you can do what you want on it. Of course, we have a uh, restriction because we have a specific, using a specific orbit. Uh, we have some constraint, of course, and, and, and all of this kind of information, we can supply them through what we call an interface document, which, which is uh, presenting all the requirements for, for Bartolomeo. Uh, but think that uh, even if you don't respect, not able to respect this requirement, we are able, we are able to to, to propose even uh, um, um, to enlarge the this requirement. But we is a case per case, of course, depending of, of, of different uh, uh, factors. We are not fully depending from Earth Airbus and some more depending from the ISS activity on the ISS. So I will stop here. Thank you very much for inten inten uh, intention. Uh, if you have some question, please feel free to uh, to ask. We're pleased to, to answer them. All right, merci Yannick. Uh, that was a great mm -hmm. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so if anyone has any questions, please use the chat window. Otherwise, I'll, I'll ask Yannick a, a few questions here. Um, I'm curious to know, um, what kind of payloads, or, or or what are the kinds of customers that you get, you typically get for this? Um, it, are there a large amount of academic researchers or private companies or? Yes. Yeah, so um, sorry. Yes, to to we have two three type of customer. Uh, so because you see, we have very uh, versatile uh, capacity capacity in terms of volume. So when we look at the big payload, of course, we are more of uh, large institutions, uh, space institutions, uh, space agencies. So we have a partnership with ESA, of course. So we have large scientific payloads from ESA, mainly focusing our um, um, Earth, Earth, or uh, we say more uh, atmospheric uh, uh, observation. Uh, so uh, magnetic field of the earth, uh, some lighting effect, uh, and so on. So it's, it's, it's many focusing of scientific payload. But in terms of um, technology demonstration, uh, we have a lot of uh, requests from industry. Uh, for, for instance, uh, a very, very uh, topic, uh, which is uh, in space manufacturing, for instance. So it's more, uh, we sell um, company, uh, industrial companies uh, for demonstration, many demonstration, but uh, as well operating. So we are very proud to to be partner to some projects and to, to us in, we have to be a passion a little bit to, 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 to perform such, such operation. After we, we can also as well uh, medium uh, medium payload. So here we, we have more SMEs, medium and small, sorry, so SMEs and, and startups, uh, what we usually call the, the, <laughs> the new space. So many for uh, in-orbit demonstration, I should say, or even even we have some cases to start to start some 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 business demonstration uh, because you know the, the trend is of a constellation and the building a constellation take time it, take, it costs a lot and and so you we have a customer where we are starting their, their business case uh, using Bartolomeo at uh, at a limited cost I would say. And of course, we are open to, to all kinds of institutions, universities, schools. Uh, uh, we are as well uh, working with UNOSA. Maybe you've heard during the IC, we, we grant uh, uh, an African consortium to fly uh, Earth observation uh, payload for, for climate observation. Uh, we are very proud of that. Uh, in, nearly two years. So uh, this is very, it's, it's, of, it's open to, to everybody. We try to, to make it affordable for, for every, every, everybody. And uh, even if we if we find some, some price list, uh, uh, we are trying to, to make this mission happening for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, a point, because, sorry, I will say because of uh, Canada and Canada is as well a uh, partner for, for the ISS. Um, when we, um, I said we, the services include the, uh, the launch and the up 
a, a mass of the of the payload. Uh, it means if your payload, if your experiment is sponsored by the CSA, Canadian Space Agency, in this case, uh, the CSA has to uh, take the a mass uh, from is uh, we said from is uh, how we could say that uh, uh, from his uh, commitment or to towards the, the ISS. So it's something which has to be negotiated between you and and, and the CSA if your payload is is sponsored by by CSA. CSA. But if you have a private company or or independent from the CSA, you will get your mass uh, included in these in these services. Gotcha. It's, okay, impo great. it's important for it's important for Canada to not that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. No, no, and that's good. I mean, I think providing that kind of access to uh, in space platform is really important. It's a really a good uh, stepping stone as well towards larger missions and and making that accessible. I think is uh, is a great great business. And um, and and, and, and um, another remark because uh, so if you want to do it and uh, CSA is uh, maybe uh, not willing to support your project, you can always address your request to the cases. For instance, in US, even if you're a Canadian company, uh, on, and even to NASA. Uh, and we have already have a case with a big uh, industrial group from uh, from Canada, who is is is, 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 uh, is managing his request for for, for cases. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. Good to know. Um, we do have another uh, question in the chat window here from uh, oh. Marie Jose Potvin in uh, at the CSA. Uh, she asks, uh, "Do you provide power to these payloads?" Yeah, yeah. Sorry, yes. Uh, the power. Uh, you, we, we, so uh, we are connected to ISS, so we get uh, the data transfer capacity and the power from the ISS. So in mean time of power, we can get uh, eight hundred watt. We said is the maximum nominal value, as we said. But we can even, if you have specific request, and uh, when you are doing some experiment using a radar, for instance, so we need really a lot of power. Uh, so here we are able, and we have, we have to make specific requests to, to have more. And, and and data data uh, data transfers as well done for the MPCC. So uh, uh, we provide the, what is the standard the standard uh, data rate. But uh, don't forget uh, to consider uh, it's not only a question of data rate; it's the data volume available per day. And and, and you know that the, the ISS is quite 35% uh, I think of the time is uh, is able to to transfer data. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can get quite a lot of minutes per day. To, 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 to download your, your data. So it's, it's a quite a, a big advantage comparing to, 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 to satellite solution, for instance. Yeah, was, uh, and, and so do you get experiments that can do some real-time operations, say, of a robotic system? Yeah, yeah. So real real time, you saw you had always this latency. So uh, we, we, we can propose uh, 30, 75 percent of an orbit during an orbit of 90 minutes, it's 75% uh, of, of the time you can you can get in a, in a relative uh, so-called real time. We said uh, momentum, you 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 data down uh, down. Um, don't forget, you are not alone in the ISS. You are not alone of Bartolomeo, but we are, you are not alone <laughs> on, on, on the ISS. So you are different user. And of course, this kind of, of, of operation, requesting download and even upload, have to be managed between all the requests that the ISS could have. So it can be sometimes we are not, you, are, you will not be allowed to, to download you download, sorry, your you, you data because another user uh, got the priority. Mm -hmm. But something is prepared, you have to be prepared. So uh, is, is uh, something quite usual on the ISS. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and I mean, I think that's pretty normal in any sort of model, unless you know you own the spacecraft and you have the yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you're you're always dealing with those priorities. I know uh, in the lunar yeah, exploration, yeah. that's going to be a big a big problem for sure. Um, all right. Well, thank you very much, Enik, for the great presentation and, and accommodating the time zone. I'm sure it's quite late there in Germany right now. So. Thank you. Thank you a lot. And thank you for your support for the, for the slides. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very yeah. appreciated. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Excellent. So we'll go to our next speaker now. And uh, I, of course, lost my screen again. There we go. So our next speaker is Haley uh, Sapers from York University. Haley, are you there? There we go. I see you. Yes, and thank you. Perfect. And would you like to bring up your slides? So 
uh, Haley's uh, uh, slide or presentation is called, uh, well, Madge, is it Madge? Mage. Uh, Mage. Mage. Mage, an, uh, an off-axis integrated cavity enhanced output spectrometer enabling high-frequency near-surface trace gas measurements on Mars. All right, Haley, take it away. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much. My name is Haley Sapers. I'm a research associate at York University, and I've been working with John Moores and his team on, on MAGE, which is the um, is a it's a mission concept to enable high frequency near surface trace gas measurements on Mars with a specific focus on methane. Um, we're dominantly supported by two main grants, one on the science side of things and one on the technical and engineering side. Um, I'm going to represent and speak mostly to the science side uh, today. So why Mars? Uh, there's been a number of observations of methane on Mars, which has really led to more questions than answers. Um, we've variably noticed both from ground-based telescopic observations as well as orbital-based observations around Mars and landed observations from the surface of Mars um, that there's methane in the Martian atmosphere. And this is particularly odd because methane should only have about a lifetime of 300 years in the Martian atmosphere. So the, um, the fact that we're seeing or observing methane at all suggests that there are unknown sources and sinks of methane, uh, which hint at enigmatic uh, geochemical processes on the planet. So the significance of methane is uh, it has this um, great astro astrobiological potential. Uh, over 90% of methane on Earth is actually biogenic, and much of that biogenic methane can be produced by microbes that live in the subsurface in the complete absence of not only oxygen, but also any organic matter. So they basically, they're, they're fixing carbon dioxide and other carbon compounds and gaining energy um, by mediating uh, redox reactions and releasing methane. Uh, the detection of methane in the Martian atmosphere does suggest these unknown, potentially biological or geochemical processes with these unknown sources of sinks. And there's two key measurements or variability in these methane observations. So it's not just that we see methane in the Martian atmosphere, but that the levels that we're detecting actually vary. So there's an overall background level of less than about one part per billion per volume. Um, and because methane should have a 300 year lifespan in the Martian atmosphere, uh, the detection by itself is, is interesting, but models suggest that this background level should only vary by about 20% at the MSL landing site. And I'll show you later that, that we're actually seeing a variability on an or but a factor of three. Um, we also see these episodic plumes, or the release of significant amounts of methane in the atmosphere over a relatively short time span. Uh, I'm going to talk about one of these plumes specifically, which was observed by Earth-based telescopes in 2003. This was a significant amount of methane that was released. And the current mixing models suggest that if this plume um, just basically dissipated and mixed into the atmosphere, it should have left a mixed background signal of about 10 parts per billion, which is of course not what we're seeing. It's about an order of magnitude higher than what we're seeing. So not only do we have these unknown sources of methane on Mars, but we also have these unknown sinks. Uh, one of the problems with understanding uh, the methane cycle on Mars is that we have a real paucity of measurements. So ground-based measurements on board MSL um, limited to about two measurements a year. And uh, methane is, of course, a trace gas in the Martian atmosphere, making it difficult to detect, as well as it's um, we're looking at methane releases quite close to the surface. So focusing in on that variability, we see both the seasonal cycle and these episodic plumes. The seasonal cycle was really defined by the Curiosity Science team using the tunable laser spectrometer on board MSL. And we found that there was a seasonal cycle that was repeatable over, um, over at least three Martian years. And the cycle saw a, a rise of methane in the summer with a decrease over the northern fall with a variability of about factor three from about 0.2 to 0.7 parts per billion. We also see these episodic plumes, and the episodic plumes have been noted several times, um, and they've been detected um, ground-based, um, Earth-based telescopes, as well as ground-based on Mars and orbital. And so this is just a map of methane concentration, um, and you can see that the, the methane concentration released there in the northern summer was about um, 190,000 tons of, of methane. So these are not small events. 
So just to summarize, we have this enigmatic dynamic variation in methane in the Martian atmosphere. We have both a seasonal cycle and these episodic plume events that happen on less than a diurnal time scale. Um, these hint at unknown biogeochemical processes on Mars. Um, so we have these episodic plumes, the seasonal background seepage, with them just noting here the variation um, in both the plumes events as well as the background seepage. The shortest plume event was actually observed, um, and then five hours later, a repeat observation was made, and uh, no methane uh, was actually detected above background in that second observation. So we know that the plumes can decay in as little as five hours. And then observations of both of these variations have been made both by uh, Mars Express, which is a Martian orbiter, the Chusenable Tunable Laser Spectrometer on board MSL in Gale Crater, as well as Earth-based telescopic observations. So there's been a number of potential sources and sinks of methane um, that have been proposed, um, including um, oxidation and radiation, as well as um, just absorption and diffusion into the Martian regolith. Um, the actual generation of microbes could be um, abiotic through abiotic processes, such as um, uh, hydrolysis, and radiolysis of rocks and um, atmospheric gases and water in the Martian subsurface. And then we have this potential question of um, subsurface microbes. So is there an active subsurface biosphere on Mars that could be uh, responsible for this, this rapid, these rapid plumes and decay of, of methane? Distinguishing between these sources really does involve getting a better handle on the variability of methane. And that's something that we're really lacking right now. Um, Currently, we don't have many measurements close in time together, and measurements are quite far apart, especially on the ground with uh, Curiosity only taking two measurements a year. Now, in order to capture, better understand a dynamic process, the observations of that process necessarily must happen on a cadence um, that's in line with or captures the variability or the cadence of the variation itself. And so here's just a cartoon schematic. Um, showing there the, the evolution of methane at the bottom in that, that red bar um, and the evolution of the methane concentration over the day. So now we're talking about a diurnal variation um, varies um, depending on the changing th thickness of the atmospheric layer that mixes with the surface, which is known as the planetary boundary layer. So we do have these mixing events um, that are constrained by diurnal events. And so if we have measurements that are happening on a slower cadence, so they're not happening um, fast enough to capture um, these other dynamical processes on Mars, we're not going to have a really good chance at being able to distinguish between the potential sources and sinks. So our observational limits really limit our understanding. So just to summarize, a dynamic process requires observations at a high, high or a higher frequency than the observed variation. The shortest known plume event um, is five hours. So we're talking that we really do need hourly measurements. Um, current limits, uh, one of the limits is that taking measurements on MSL with TLS uh, is pretty resource intensive. It requires uh, pumping and uh, pumping the atmospheric gas over CO2 scrubber. Um, and this limits really limits to about two measurements a year. And orbital measurements are really restricted in time. So orbital limb measurements are restricted to, to dawn and dusk, and so TGO on Mars Express, um, as well as sun synchronous mapping orbits are restricted to midday and midnight. So some examples of those are MRO and MGS. So we really have this need for high frequency, low resource measurements near the surface. Just to kind of summarize that in a schematic format, so this is just showing these unexplored regions um, in the Martian clock. So if we have Mars here, it's this big brown um, circle in the middle here, um, kind of a, a, a clock there going from midday to sunset to midnight to sunrise. And then we have a uh, distance from the surface through the planetary boundary layer up to about a thousand kilometers. And we can see where we have our orbital limb measurements, we have our Mars uh, TLS measurements and possible LIDAR measurements um, limited uh, both in time and space. Looking at the graph there on the right, we really have this high frequency zone um, across all altitudes. It's really unexplored. Um, and the MAGE mission concept actually fits within this near surface high frequency box. So we're looking at making um, hourly to sub hourly measurements of methane 
in the near surface that really captures this unexplored area uh, to really try to distinguish between these unknown sources of sinks of methane on Mars to better understand this enigmatic variability that has been observed so far. So the key measurement goals for MAGE would be um, both continuous hourly monitoring as well as monitoring plume events. So our continuous hourly monitoring would record subdiurnal variations, which are currently unknown, and would hopefully cap capture the ramp up and decay of a plume event. The ramp up and decay of a plume event has also never been measured or captured before. Um, one of these goals would be to capture the entire diurnal cycle of background seepage over at least two Mars years. And during a plume event, um, we could autonomously detect anonymously high measures, um, autonomously high measurements of, of methane and increase the measurement cadence, um, looking at isotopic ratio of methane released during the plume event. These isotopic um, ratios can help distinguish between potentially biogenic and abiotic sources of methane. These measurements would be contextualized with additional atmospheric measurements that would include temperature, pressure, wind speed and direction, as well as relative humidity. The MAGE instrument itself um, is built around the off-axis integrated cavity enhanced output spectrometer, which is a technology currently in development with, by ABB. Um, essentially, this spectrometer exists both in these um, kind of 11 to 15 kilogram packages, which are field deployable, as well as drone mounted packages. And we are currently um, being used in, for remote, and, um, remote environmental monitoring. The uh, MAGE instrument itself um, consists of um, a, a laser that is offset with respect to the optical cavity. This offset mitigates optical interference and optical feedback. The high finesse optical cavity includes highly reflective mirrors within the gas cell that reflect the laser back and forth over a thousand times. Um, this results in an effective optical path length of up to 25 kilometers and can be configured to reach an effective path length of 100 kilometers. This elongated path link enhances the absorption of the gas uh, such that sensitivity can be increased by over 10,000 times compared to the tunable laser spectrometer on board MSL. So just in summary, the off-axis, uh, the ICOS or the off-axis integrated cavity output spectrometer is a small um, gas analyzer that can fit within um, a 6U package. Uh, that is capable of conducting hourly to sub-hourly sub-PPP measurements of methane in the near surface atmosphere. Uh, currently looking at about a three kilogram payload with low power. It uses um, this patented ABB uh, laser absorption technology that's currently in development. Uh, and in it, it's, uh, it's, it's fast and sensitive and precise such that averaging an integration time of less than five minutes can achieve the sub-PPP accuracy. The optical cavity provides these elongated effective path lengths that can increase dynamic range, um, but also sensitivity compared to um, uh, the current measurement options on the surface of Mars. The instrument itself is very robust and it does not require exact alignment of opticals and the simple back end electronics make it um, especially um, uh, applicable for, for space flight um, because it makes it very resistant to vibration uh, during launch and EDL, as well as temperature variations. The measurements that we hope to be to, to, to make to characterize both the plumes and the background seepage, um, so we require these high frequency measurements. Again, we want to, to um, both measure the background seepage as well as plume events. So we have uh, two separate cadences planned, um, hourly measurements, and then autonomous detection of a plunament can um, initiate uh, uh, measurements at an increased cadence during that plume event. The increased concentration of emitted gases during the plume can enable the measurement of additional uh, parameters such as sister gases, such as ethane, as well as potentially the isotopic ratio of methane within the plume. Additional species that we'd like to measure um, for the background with this hourly cadence um, are methane, of course, as well as ozone to correct for methane concentration measurements. Um, the Martian atmosphere is dominantly CO2. This can be used for calibration as well as total atmospheric pressure. Um, additional uh, carbon monoxide can be used to assess carbon oxygen cycling and atmospheric disequilibrium, as well as oxygen to better understand the oxidation potential of the Martian atmosphere. 
Measuring the sister gases such as ethane and anisotropic ratios can be used to help distinguish between biogenic and abiotic methane and to assess broader Martian hydrocarbon cycles. Uh, the technology itself is um, currently in development from a uh, technology readiness level of two to a technology readiness level of five, paying particular attention to mass and power reduction. So we have um, two main field tests planned. Uh, we are planning to take MAGE up to the uh, to Axel Heiberg in the High Canadian Arctic. Um, and Axel Heiberg Island is a spring system there called Lost Hammer Springs. These springs are uh, perennial cold springs that actually exist in the permafrost. Um, and what's exciting about these springs is they're also methane seeps. So we're hoping to bring a portable mage instrument um, up to Axel Heiberg and use it to monitor uh, methane evolution from these spring systems. We're also planning um, a stratospheric balloon flight um, in late 2023 um to to test the uh operation of the instrument um in the terrestrial uh, stratosphere the two main science goals uh, science goal one is really to understand the chemistry of the near surface Martian atmosphere this science goal uh, ties nicely to that hourly cadence measurement measurement um, and we're really here looking at that background um, seasonal uh, diurnal cycle so there's two sub-objectives, uh, determining whether the observed diurnal and seasonal variations of methane, oxygen, and carbon monoxide in the Martian atmosphere are consistent with near-surface methane plume events overprinting um, a seasonal variation. So the observables here are, are, are the methane, oxygen, um, carbon monoxide, as well as pressure and temperature. And so what we're really here um, targeting are these um, hourly measurements over at least um, one to two Martian years. Our second sub goal here is to determine whether these target gas fluxes um, are actually consistent with a micro seepage model. And so this is just um, would be methane um, seeping up, diffusing um, through the Martian regolith. Additional parameters here would involve measuring wind speed and wind direction also at that hourly cadence. Our science goal too is really to try to gain access to the Martian subsurface without drilling into the Martian subsurface, um, because it's very likely that this methane is being released from the subsurface. A better understanding of the qualities of this, this methane release, including its cadence and the ramp up and decay of these plumes can give us clues into the processes that are occurring in the Martian subsurface. So this um, science objectives associated with science goal two tie nicely to these the, the measurements that occur on a plume cadence. So these would involve the autonomous identification of a methane spike and um, a sub-hourly measurement cadence. The science objectives here are really to determine whether the methane plume events are consistent with subsurface Martian evolution. Here we're looking at measuring the methane itself as well as um, the, the ozone absorption line and the, um, the, the hydrogen peroxide absorption line there. So we're really looking at the concentration of the absorber and trying to better calibrate that. This uh, sub-objective two is looking at whether the Martian plume events are consistent with a biogenic source. And so we are um, looking at the evolution of sister gases such as, as ethane here, as well as developing the capability of assessing the carbon-12 to carbon-13 ratio um, in the methane exhaled during the plume event. There are um, two mission scenarios um, that the MAGE instrument could be configured for. Um, so it could uh, both rover mounted, which would allow us to acquire methane observations over several locations, um, or potentially network rover mounted, considering its small um, massive power requirements. And then second was actually work done in collaboration with Magellan Aerospace, um, looking at the concept of a landed weather station. In both cases, we'd be measuring um, atmospheric, uh, atmospheric condition metrics, such as the temperature, pressure, and wind speed, um, including addition, additional instruments such as a sonic on anemometer. It would include the, gas, the ICOS gas analyzer itself, as well as command power control and communication. I'll leave up um, this summary slide, but uh, uh, just quickly, um, MAGE uh, is centered around a sub-PPM level methane analyzer 
based on the integrated cavity enhanced output spectrometer for exploring methane in the Martian atmosphere. Uh, methane on Mars. Uh, methane is a key gas for understanding the astrobiological potential of Mars. And uh, the variability that we see in methane suggests that the sources and sinks are not well understood. So there's a high potential um, for, for discovery. We have two key methane behaviors, uh, our plume events, as well as the background seepage events, necessitating two types of measurements cadences, both capturing um, seasonal variations with an hourly measurements, as well as um, a faster cadence during the plume events. Our uh, understanding of methane in the Martian atmosphere is really limited by the current paucity of measurements. And so there's a, there's a real need here for being able to take these um, high frequency sensitive measurements. We have a high potential for scientific return. Diurnal background seepage allows the seepage of methane from the subsurface uh, to be locally measured. And so observing the onset and decay of plumes would allow for models of methane production and destruction, destruction to be tested um, and isotopic analysis of plumes can address whether the methane on Mars has a potential biological source. The ICOS instrument itself um, it can fit within a 6U payload, and it's capable of conducting these hourly sub-PPB measurements of methane in the near surface atmosphere, working towards a 3 kilogram payload, and developing isotopic capabilities. The optical cavity produces an elongated effective path length, um, which can increase sensitivity of up to 10,000 times over that uh, compared to the SAM TLS instrument currently on board um, Curiosity. The instrument itself is robust, um, exact alignment is not critical, and the simple electronic back and mitigate vibrations um, associated with launching EDL. Um, so with that, I'd be happy to take um, any questions. All right. Thank you very much uh, for the presentation, Haley. Um, if anyone has any questions, please use the chat window. I, I don't see any as of right now. Um, I had thought of a few during your presentation. However, you subsequently then answered them with the next slide. So great presentation. <laughs> um, I guess one, one question that comes to mind is uh, looking at the mission concepts that you've explored. Um, what what kind of uh, mission opportunities do you foresee for this instrument? You know, I guess there's some concepts, but are there any are there kind of uh, planned future missions to Mars that um, you're looking to uh, to kind of seize an opportunity to fly this payload? Um, well, we haven't identified um, a specific mission. I think we're we're all eagerly awaiting um, the release of the next decadal survey. Mm -hmm. um, we had a couple of white papers uh, that were accepted um, into the survey. Um, and we're co-authors on, on several others that were also addressing this issue of how do we do this high frequency measurement of Martian methane. So I think the decadal survey is really going to direct um, the types of, of missions that we'll see exploring the surface of Mars. And so you really do have this flexibility to target both um, landed missions as well as rover mounted missions. Um, so it's a difficult question to, to ask. I, um, yeah. We'll kind of see what the the next uh, decade holds. That's it's certainly an exciting mission concept, and uh, I'm glad to hear you are uh, influencing the decadal surveys, and, and uh, hopefully that'll lead to a, a NASA-led uh, mission using this kind of payload. It's it's great. Um, okay. Well, I don't see any uh, other questions, and we are uh, at about wrap up time uh, for this session. So I want to thank you, Haley, and the rest of the speakers for the really interesting presentations this afternoon. Um, I also believe that this might be um, the last presentation of the Cassie Astro uh, event this year. Uh, I think it went fairly smoothly considering it's all still virtual in 2021. Hopefully 2022 will bring uh, a, um, an in-person uh, event to this. It's always, uh, this is, we're getting used to these virtual events, but you know, it'd be nice to, to see each other in person again, I think. So hopefully next year. Uh, and for those of you who haven't uh, noticed or, or, or signed up yet, uh, tomorrow there's a Space Domain Awareness Workshop. Uh, and it's really interesting, uh, very active uh, field right now, uh, especially given the uh, recent activities, the um, anti-satellite uh, uh, missile activities in Russia. I'm sure that's going to be a hot topic for, for tomorrow's workshop. So. Um, 
with that, I'd like to wish you all a great Thursday evening. Thank you very much for attending Cassie Astro and uh, hopefully see you uh, next year. Bye-bye.